bless the Lord on this amazing Lord's Day. Amen. Welcome to Woodside Community Church. I pray your soul is prepared to worship the awesome and gracious God who created you for his sovereign purpose. Visitors, we're glad to have you. So glad that you uh, allowed your feet to be turned in our direction. I pray that you would uh, continue to come back and come back more and more and that we may get to know you better and we may worship and praise the Lord together. Um, if you uh, aren't inclined, please fill out the visitor's card in the uh, pew back in front of you and at the end of the service, just place it in the collection plate and if everyone will place their uh, phones on uh, vibrate out of respect for our time of worship, we'd appreciate it. Your call to worship. Your call to worship comes out of Psalm chapter 67. That's page 481 if you're using the Pew Bible. Psalm 67, page 481, out of the Pew Bible. There, the word of our Lord says, may God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us that your way may be known on earth, your saving power among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy for you judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has yielded its increase. God, our God, shall bless. God shall bless us. Let all the ends of the earth fear him. Let us pray. O oh, oh God, who is God but the Lord? And who is the rock except our God? Father, you equipped us with strength and made our way blameless. Thank you for gathering us together this Lord's day. We have come to praise you. We have come to cast all our cares upon you because your safekeeping over us has been steadfast and movable and always abounding in goodness. The earth has yielded its increase towards us as you have truly blessed us. Now we ask you to use us to bless others. By doing this, we truly bless you. So as we worship you, Lord, let us remember that your great benevolence towards us not only showed up at the point of our salvation, but continues to be with us even this very day and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Let's all rise. And you sing a person together, holy, holy, holy.
scripture reading comes out of Psalm chapter 42, page 469, if you're using the Pew Bible. Psalm chapter 42, page 469 in your Pew Bible. This is the holy word of God. As a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night, while they say to me all the day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I would go with a throng and lead them in procession to the house of God with glad shouts and songs of praise, a multitude keeping festival. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. My soul is cast down within me, Therefore, I remember you from the land of Jordan and Hermon, from Mount Mizar. Deep calls to deep, at the roar of your waterfalls, all your breakers and your waves have gone over me. By day, the Lord commands his steadfast love, and at night, his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with a deadly wound in my bones, my adversaries taunt me, while they say to me all the day long, where is your God? Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. Let us pray. Father, your word has blessed and kept us through every trial and the numerous difficulties we have faced. Your spirit has convicted us, taught us, and strengthened us in our greatest moments of sin, confusion, and fear. In our own strength, we failed continually. Please forgive us for thinking we can do anything apart from you. May we remember that we're not wrestling against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities of evil, and against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, the spiritual forces of evil that surrounds us. May we believe the scripture that warns us there must be factions among us in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. Lord, may we be found as those who are genuine and not of those dissenters, gossipers, and separators who uh, uh, work within the church to undermine the unity you so deserve. I pray we would remember the words that the Apostle Paul asked the church. Do you despise the church of God? May, my God, may it never be so. Not here, Lord. It is enough we have to dodge the evil darts of the wicked one outside of these doors. May we not have to do the same within. Whether it's prayer, fellowship, corporate worship, private worship, or reading and meditating on the word of God, may we grab hold of the good graces that you have provided for us, which helps us to glorify you now and enjoy you forever. Lord, we pray for those in the northern Ethiopian region of Tigray who are perishing daily <clears throat> from hunger since U.S. and U.N. officials stopped sending aid due to the, to the stealing and selling of the food warehouse for the poor. May wisdom and judgment be granted to those in authority. Wisdom to save lives and judgment to penalize the wrongdoers with righteous judgment. We long for the day when righteousness and justice will cover the globe, when Christ will reign and evil will be no more upon the earth, when tears of sorrow will be replaced by tears of joy. Come quickly, Lord. We pray your spirit will be upon the preacher this morning as he uses your word to give sight to the spiritually blind and light to those dwelling in darkness. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.
Uh, next song is a new song we're introducing today. Um, it's, it's titled Where Thou Leadest Me. Please be seated. Children, you are now dismissed. Go learn the gospel and have fun. And for the rest of you, good morning. We have been in the gospel according to John for over two and a half years. Can you believe it? John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let them be afraid, says the Savior who has overcome the world. So shall our hearts be troubled when we hear uh, and dwell upon the words of Christ? Surely the word of God brings comfort and fortitude to our hearts and make the love of God sensible and bright to our souls. So may the life-giving truth this morning give you hope and give Christ the honor and praise that he rightly deserves. So with that said, let me pray for us and we'll dive into the text. Let's pray. O oh Lord our God, the God of comfort, we now plead with you that you will do great and marvelous things in this hour. I pray that you will make your presence sensible in the midst of 
this congregation, and I pray that you provide timely help and comfort to the saints in Christ. And I pray that you will do the supernatural work of uh, enlightening the darkened minds and the dead, uh, and resurrect the dead hearts of those who are apart from Christ, O oh Lord. Today we have come before you to hear your word preached. I pray that Christ will be set forth as an all-sufficient Savior to every single soul present in the sanctuary, we pray. Amen. Today is July 2nd, 2023. We're at the exact half point of this year. This is the 183rd day of this year. We have 182 days behind us and 182 more days ahead of us. We are at the half point of this year. During our long distance race into the second half, we're the last third of the race, even though this usually happens to me in the first 400 yards of the race, runners uh, sometimes hit the wall. Right? They, they have been running for so long, so far, that their bodies cannot access the, the fields in their body very easily, and so they begin to slow down. I, I heard it's an awful feeling. Have you reached that critical point in the race of living in 2023? How has this year been for you? The irresistible and the sovereign providential will of God has been unfolding slowly and steadily one day at a time. Has it been smooth sailing for you or has it been hills of difficulty and valleys of the shadow of death? So I knew I was going to preach today and I had a written an entirely different sermon for today and I finished it quite early. It was a rough sermon, leaning more toward the astonishing and convicting side and the first sentence of that sermon was, this was going to be a rough sermon. Then, then I attended our small group, and then I spoke to members of the church, some members of our church, and then I thought about what I know about some of you. And so I reached the conclusion, if the purpose of the sermon is to glorify Christ, build his church, and give timely spiritual help for the saints, in the way they live, then perhaps another sermon is needed. An astonishing, uh, 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 admonishing and convicting sermon can come uh, on any other day, any day really. A comforting and encouraging sermon might be more appropriate at this juncture of the year. Proverbs 15.23, to make an apt answer is a joy to a man and a word in season how good it is. And so this sermon is about facing affliction and grief. There's never a wrong season of speaking about affliction because every season is a season of affliction and grief for some people in the church. There's never a shortage of ways to address grief because the Bible has no shortage. It is full of texts helping, comforting, and promising to believers great things in the midst of their grief. Let me tell you just a bit more, a few more things about this sermon before getting into the text. You need to know, first of all, that this sermon is not a topical sermon. In other words, I am not just talking about suffering uh, based on life experience or general scriptural wisdom. I am talking about suffering by looking at a particular text of the Bible. So there will be heavy exegesis and interpretation in this sermon. And you should know that is a good thing. This is not a weakness or a shortcoming or an inefficiency of the sermon, and that is not a hindrance to facing grief. Exegeting and interpreting the Bible is never irrelevant, but always helpful, even for people who are steep in grief. You should also know that this sermon is not an intellectual exercise. No sermons ought to be intellectual exercises. A sermon about dealing with grief has even less luxury of indulging the mere intellect and neglecting the real issue. We're considering real afflictions with real impact upon the souls of real people. We've got no time to waste on trivial rambling and abstract discourses on grief. The sermon is not meant to stimulate your intellect, but bring biblical hope and comfort to the struggling and suffering saints. You should also know that this sermon is not a counseling session, which means I cannot listen to you, but you have to listen to me for a 50, some 50 minutes. 
I hope I'll be interesting and helpful enough to make this one-way communication less miserable and more desirable to your ears. It also means I cannot possibly address particularly every single situation present in this room, but I am addressing every single person as situation in this room altogether. All right, Martin Lloyd-Jones said this about preaching. It is quite astonishing to find that in expounding the scriptures, you're able to deal with a variety of differing conditions altogether in one service. That is what I mean by saying it saves the pastor a lot of time. If he had to see all these people one by one, his life would be impossible. But in one sermon, he can cover quite a number of problems at one and the same time. So remember, just because I didn't say your name or call out the specific trials you are going through, I will not do that to anyone today in this sermon. That does not mean I am not speaking to your situation. Quite the opposite. If you have known me and we have spoken at length or in passing about your distress or the distress of another brethren in Christ, then most likely I wrote this sermon with you specifically in mind. So feel free to read yourself into this sermon. You should know that this sermon is not necessarily going to make everything magically get better. If you have ever preached or taught any Bible study at home or at church, or if you have ever evangelized to anyone, you surely know how powerless our words are to change someone. Far less a thorny situation that has been the source of endless seemingly endless grief. So the sermon does not guarantee everything will be smooth sail once you get out of this church. Uh, you will never feel the bitter sting of sorrow anymore. But at the same time, you should also bear in mind, we're not here to listen to me, are we? Though this sermon may not heal you, the word of God you hear today will. So expect God to do great things today. And finally, you need to know the sermon is designed to bring God's word to bear in your life. I want to take a text in the Bible and apply it to your life and your situation. I didn't say the words that, I'm, uh, the, that we're about to read. God did. I'm a mere messenger. I'm trying to explain and impress the text deeply in your mind. I pray that you will listen attentively, prayerfully, and well. And if you are helped, give glory to God. John Calvin, he wrote in the commentary on the book of Psalms, I have been accustomed to call this book, I think not inappropriately, an anatomy of all the parts of the soul. For there is not an emotion of which anyone can be conscious that is not here represented as in a mirror. Or rather, the Holy Spirit has here drawn to life all the griefs, sorrows, fears, doubts, hopes, cares, perplexities, in short, all the distracting emotions with which the minds of men are wont or prone to be agitated. So now, shall we put in focus these distracting emotions and hear the words of hope from the God of comfort? So if you have the physical copy of the Bible with you, please turn to the 34th Psalm. We will be in verse 19. The 34th Psalm, verse 19. Psalm 34, verse 19. Let me read the text for you, and please pay close attention to every verse, because this is the word of God. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. This verse has two halves, and so I want to draw your attention to two things from this text. First, the problem. It amazes me just how the Bible always so simply yet profoundly describes our problem with no sugarcoating nor exaggeration, just the problem as it is. And secondly, the promise. Great problems require great solutions, and the great solution we have today before us is the great promise from God. So two simple points for you this morning, the problem and the promise. So let's begin with point number one, the problem. What is the problem in view in the text? It's the first half of our verse, verse 19. Look at verse 19. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. It's a short sentence, but it's a sentence with great depth and great sympathy. Right? Let, let's focus on three things in this half of the verse. Number one, consider who it is that the psalmist speaks of 
here. Consider who it is that the psalmist speaks of here. It is the righteous, verse 19. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. Well, what about Romans 3.10? Right? None is righteous, no, not one. So I guess this verse doesn't apply to anyone. It says no one is righteous, and God only delivers the righteous. Right? You need not fear that you're not perfectly righteous, and right? you still sin. Right? Look at the title of the psalm. The title of the psalm. The, the small font-sized um, words before verse 1. All right, so who wrote this psalm? Of David. When did he write this psalm? When he changed his behavior before Abimelech so that he drove him out and he went away. So this is during a time when he was murderously pursued by Saul. And so when David wrote Psalm 19, many are the afflictions of the righteous, he's talking more than he's talking about more than just himself, but he is definitely not talking less uh, about less than himself. He is counting himself as a righteous man. At verse 19, it says, God delivers the righteous. And then look at verse 4. Who does God deliver? David wrote this about himself. I saw the Lord, and he answered me, and he delivered me from all my fears. Verse 15 uh, says, the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous, and his ears toward their cry, right? The, the righteous. Now, look at verse 6. Who is God hearing or listening to? David again spoke about himself. This poor man, David cried, and the Lord heard him. So David is extending and applying his personal experience to all righteous men. Now, David, how can you count yourself as a righteous man? You committed adultery with Bathsheba. You murdered her, her, her husband Uriah. How dare you count yourself a righteous man. How can you put yourself in that category, David? Well, the answer is threefold. Number one, David is righteous and blameless in the matter of Saul, which is the context of this psalm. Number two, David has sinned, but the general trajectory of his, and the record of his life is largely that of godliness and righteousness. He's not perfect, but he is a godly, pious, and God-fearing man. And lastly, and thirdly, of course, David is counted by God as righteous through faith in the son of David, Jesus Christ. Now, why am I telling you this? I'm telling you this because it is quite easy to read these psalms and say to yourself, well, I am not the righteous, or well, I am not David, and so this psalm doesn't apply to me. In a sense, you're right. You are not David, none of us are David, and none of us are perfectly righteous. But insofar as this psalm is concerned, there is no difference. You suffer just as innocently as David. Your life is overall characterized by as one of godliness as much as David's life. And you certainly share the same faith in Christ to which you are justified before God as David. This psalm, in particular this verse, verse 19, is about you and it is for you. And so we can draw three implications from this fact, that this verse is about the righteous in Christ. It's about you if you're in Christ this morning. First of all, the, the obvious implication is uh, if you, to those of you who are apart from Christ uh, this morning, this sermon is not for you. This sermon is not for you. I say this not with a sense of gloating or pride. I say this rather with grief and sadness. I could not be more glad and thankful to God who brought you here this morning. But the majority of this sermon is not directly applicable to you. So please don't walk away with a comfort that is not for you and think all is well for you. The promise is not for you. And the comfort uh, is, the promise is not just therapeutic uh, for you. Uh, many may indeed be your afflictions. This part of the text may apply to you, but the promise of deliverance and comfort we're getting to the second part of the text is not for you. But maybe, paradoxically, the sermon is for you. Because this sermon will tell you how you can become the righteous so that you may indeed obtain the second, ha the second half of the verse, the promise of comfort and affliction. At this moment, you are outside of the blessing, but maybe through the means of this very sermon, as you walk out of this church today, 
you're changed into a new man, and this promise will be rightly yours. So don't just check out yet. Now, the second implication is equally important, and I speak to the saints who have been purchased and redeemed by Christ. To you, I say, never ever for any reason under any circumstances, not for a single minute, forget what God sees when he sets his eyes upon you. You are the righteous. You are very pleasant. You are precious in his eyes. You must know and keep this in central vision that God takes pleasure and God finds delight in you. God takes pleasure and finds delight in you. You a mere mortal, someone not so famous, someone not so strong, not so healthy, you gladden and rejoice his heart. I don't yet hold my baby girl. She's still kicking about in her mother's womb. I cannot even imagine how happy I'm going to be. But that pleasure, that happiness of seeing your child falls infinitely short of God's gladness in seeing you. Psalm 33, 5, he loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the steadfast love of the Lord. Zephaniah uh, Zephaniah 3, 17, the Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. You who have trusted in Christ, you are loved cherished and treasured by God. Does that not cheer your faint and feeble heart? Does that not uplift your downcast and distressed spirit? Does that not satisfy and strengthen your troubled and tumultuous soul? When Hannah was weeping in the temple, Elkanah, her husband, told her, Hannah, why do you weep? And why do you not eat? And why is your heart sad? Am I now more to you than ten sons. Brothers, is not the love of God more to you than all the sorrows of the world? And now, lastly, related to this point, we must conclude from from this very verse addressing the righteous that not all afflictions are God's retribution and revenge for sin. All afflictions are from God, but not all afflictions from God come from a heart of wrath and fury for the simple reason that God loves the righteous all the time. Uh, But he sends them tribulations, trials, troubles, nonetheless. We must not make the error of Job's friends. There is no one-to-one correspondences and causality between sin and suffering. David suffered in the hands of Saul, and that has nothing to do with his sin. If anything, it was because of his righteousness. The situation may be tough, the trial may be hard, but you have not lost God's love and pleasure. And there is an equally powerful temptation, and it's this. You are having a rough time. You know you are having a rough time. Uh, You have not been responding to the Lord well. Uh, Maybe you are bitter, you are angry, you're jealous, you're complainful, whatever it may be, and you know you're not responding well to the Lord. And then you begin to think, maybe God is going to prolong this trial and lengthen your pain just to smite you and spite you. But be watchful, brothers, and remember God loves the righteous and God loves you. And that's the first of our considerations, is the righteous, remember, is the righteous in Christ that are in view in our text. Number two, consider what it is being emphasized. Consider what is being emphasized about the righteous. What do we learn about the righteous? It is their afflictions. Verse 19, many are the afflictions of the righteous. A brief word on on the afflictions referred to here. If you read books one and two, of of the Psalms, you will see a lot of Psalms where the psalmist seeks God's protection from the wicked persecutors and haters. In other words, the afflictions come mostly from religious persecution. But the beauty of this Psalm is its vagueness. It's never said explicitly what these afflictions are exactly. Our Psalm uses some very inclusive and general words like fears, troubles, and afflictions. In other words, 
the scope of the psalm is not narrowly restricted to one thing or one suffering, one affliction, but general. It's very general and wide. And the reason I'm telling you this is, is very simple. We as readers of this psalm in 21st century America, free from religious persecution, but still faced with common human sufferings and fears, we can still feel free to, to apply this psalm to ourselves. We need not have a sense of distance with the psalmist experience. So we need not hesitate to take hold of the promise herein. Now, verse 19. Verse 19 is freeing and relieving. Not just because it includes human suffering in general. It includes your suffering and my suffering. It is also freeing in another important sense, and it is this. There's a strange notion among the believers that Christians should not be grieved and troubled by afflictions. Even if they are, they need to handle it very well with pure joy and a complete victory. Uh, and when the sorrow does not go away, uh, when the grief deepens and decides to take up residence in the heart, then a sense of guilt and perplexity emerges. All right? If I'm a Christian, uh, why do I feel depressed? If God calls us to rejoice always, and then again I say rejoice, right, I must be doing something wrong. And as you can probably tell, guilt is not a good catalyst for the joy for which God prepares us. Right? You may sincerely believe uh, everything I'm saying uh, theoretically, right? but functionally, right, when grief strikes, you are still guilt-written and confused. Right? Verse 19. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. Being a Christian doesn't make you superhuman. Regeneration does not somehow make you, make you immune to the distress and adversities of life. Conversion does not deprive you of the ordinary human experience. The righteous Job suffered and he wept. He said, my spirit is broken, my days are extinct. He'll be more dramatic than that. The righteous David suffered and he wept. I am weary with my moaning. Every night I flood my bed with tears. I drench my couch with my weeping. The righteous Jesus suffered and he cried, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So be not harsh to yourself because verse 19 says, Many are the afflictions of the righteous. Being a Christian doesn't make you sorrow-free, but here's the good news. Being a born-again Christian puts you in a position, the only position, where you may truly rejoice and be glad, where you have the resources and the ability to overcome affliction and face grief for God's glory and your own eternal good. If you are not a Christian, you cannot even begin to rejoice. But if you are a Christian, then you have all you need to rejoice, even if it may not seem like it. Verse 19, many are the afflictions of the righteous. And that is the second of our consideration. The righteous, alongside with the unrighteous, they're both often afflicted. It is but the lot God has assigned to all men, the righteous and the unrighteous. Number three. Consider what it is said about these afflictions of the, the righteous. Consider what it is said about these afflictions of the righteous. That is, the afflictions are many. Verse 19. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. What an unfortunate word. He could have said, the righteous have afflictions in this world. He could have said, several are the afflictions of the righteous. He could have said, you will have your fair share of grief in this world. He just has to say, many are the afflictions of the righteous. Job 14, 1. Man who is born of a woman is few of days and full of trouble. Ecclesiastes 2, 23. For all his days are full of sorrow, and his work is a vexation, even in the night. The heart does not rest. This also is vanity. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. The afflictions of the righteous are many in variety. Just go through the Bible. 
Some lost their young children to death. See the widow in Luke 7. Some could not conceive a child. See Hannah. Some have disobedient children and caused endless grief. See Eli and Samuel. Some suffer poverty all their lives. See John the Baptist. Some had their great wealth stripped away from them. See Job. Some were persecuted and killed for their faith. See the apostles and the prophets. Some suffer chronic diseases. See Paul. Some were perfectly healthy and their health suddenly broke down. See Job again. And some were exiled and carried to another country never to return. See Daniel. Some married fools. See Abigail. Some were unjustly treated in the family. See Joseph. Some were betrayed by companions and friends. See David. Some were distrusted, opposed by the elites, and nailed to a cross. See Jesus. Even as I look across this room, some of you have frustrating jobs, or frustrating children, or stubborn parents. Some of you are growing weaker and ill. Some of you have unfulfilled desires and expectations. Some of you have been betrayed and sinned against and abandoned by your former spouse. Some of you lost family to death to the king of terror. And some of you just have a hard life, and that is God's lot for you in this life. Some of you have lost joy, and you don't even know where to begin uh, to get it back. Proverbs 14.10, the heart knows its bitterness, and no stranger shares its joy. Uh, The afflictions of the righteous are many in variety. The afflictions of the righteous are many in number. I count your afflictions, name them one by one, and then you lose point. You lose count at some point. It's more than you care to number. They are great in number. They are great in number all at the same time. You would love to take on these troubles of life one by one, but they come at you all together. Or maybe you would love to take on them all at the same time, but they come one by one, one after another, in rapid succession. You just want a breather. Right, a couple of peaceful days. Your afflictions, the afflictions of the righteous are great in effect. Right, you have broken down into tears. You have laid sleepless at night. You have nightmares that leave you shook in the morning. You are weighed down and overcome by emotions. You carry a great burden wherever, wherever you go. You have grown weary and languished. You have no appetite. You have not called your family in a while. Uh, you go through the motion and nothing excites you or move you, moves you anymore. You talk less or you don't talk at all. You talk uh, a lot to some people, but they have trouble understanding, sympathizing, or relating to you. You pray, but nothing changes. So you wonder what God is really doing at this time. You hang on by a thin thread. You see no joy and no meaning in life. And you ponder whether it's time to end it somehow. Despair, anxiety, dull grief, and hopelessness describe and and characterize you more and more. You start to envy other people because you think they had it easy. Uh, You wish you could be someone else. Or paradoxically, you you think about the bitterness of life uh, habitually and regularly as if it is something enjoyable. It's an enjoyable, a sweet experience worth revisiting once in a while. You're confused. You don't know what is happening to you. Verse 19, many are the afflictions of the righteous. Is there a better way to put it? I praise God, this verse doesn't end here. And so your afflictions don't end here, and so our sermon doesn't end here either. Point number two, the promise. Verse 19, many are the afflictions of the righteous, But the Lord delivers him out of them all. But the Lord delivers him out of them all. Let's again focus on on three things to impress this great and comforting promise to to our mind. Let Let me help you appreciate this verse a little more. You can miss this very easily, but let me appreciate, let me help you appreciate it. A little more. Now, first, this is the most important thing. This is absolutely the most important thing. Consider who it is that brings relief to the suffering saints. Consider who it is that brings relief 
to the suffering saints. And it's, it's the Lord. Verse 19. But the Lord delivers him out of them all. The Lord is a deliverer who delivers us from our afflictions. And we must start here. Because this is the head or the rudder that will keep the rest of the ship moving in the right direction. This is the cornerstone that will keep the entire structure and building upright and strong. Always remember this. Your relief and comfort are going to come from ultimately nowhere else but the Lord. You look at the wrong place and look for ineffective remedies when you look away from or apart from the Lord for help. My wife and I have a couple of friends, husband and wife. We love them a great deal. And we would drive two hours to see them once in a while. They're big on mental health issues, finding a Christian therapist, uh, traveling and vacationing together, but they don't go to church. They don't read the Bible together. Or they have no presence of wise and mature Christians near them to counsel them and care for them. So we pray for them every Saturday night, more, more often than that, that they will go to church. They will stay in church. They will be helped by the church. Maybe you do need to find a professional Christian counselor. Maybe you do need to get out of the house and go somewhere to go on a vacation, change your scenery. And maybe you, you even need to take medication. But make no mistake, your help comes from the Lord. None of these things can replace or substitute him. Look to God and if needed, use other legitimate and lawful means. Look to the means, but don't look apart from the giver of these means. Now, let me tell you a little bit more about this Lord who has promised to deliver all his saints. I, I want to tell you a few reasons why God is the only effective Savior. I'm going to paint a great and grand picture of God for you. The clearer and the bigger your vision of God is, and it can never be too great and too clear, uh, the more comforting this promise affords. As Spurgeon said, he, he has learned to kiss every wave that throws him up against the rock of ages, right? Let me now point you to the, that rock of ages in whom you can take refuge. So first of all, I want you to know that God is sovereign. God is sovereign. Nothing comes to pass without God's explicit decree, design, and approval according to his goodwill and pleasure. In other words, every affliction of life comes from God. You need to know that, and God wants you to know that. He is responsible for your afflictions. Lamentation 3.21, For the Lord will not cast off forever, but though he cause grief, he will have compassion. Count your afflictions, name them one by one, count your afflictions, and see what the Lord has done. Right? How is this comforting? Well, it's comforting because God is always in control. The train has not gone off the rails, and the ship has not deviated from its designated route. This trouble has come from the Lord, and so from the Lord alone does the final and ultimate resolution come. And trust me, it does come. Secondly, you need to know that God is omnipotent. God is omnipotent. We like to scoff at a can-do attitude, right? No need to scoff here. God can do. And there's no affliction that is beyond his power to bring to an end. And there's no pain too overwhelming, uh, overpowering in you for him to relieve. There is no sin too hideous and grievous for him to forgive in Christ. Your problem, your grief, your affliction may be too great, uh, too powerful for you, and may be taking up your whole world and your thoughts. And that's the only thing you can see, you can feel, and set your mind on. But it's not so with the Lord. It does not take up all of his world. It, it's, not only the, it's not the only thing he can see or think or set his mind upon. At this very moment, while you're sitting here listening and pondering 
He is upholding the universe by the word of his power. He is watching over the smallest sparrow, sustaining the most repulsive pigeons, uh, supplying the needs of the weakest worm of the earth. He is tenderly preserving your life and granting you all things good and needed at this very moment. You need to know how great, uh, how powerful this God is, especially in the time of trouble and on the day of sorrow. Thirdly, you need to know that God is compassionate. God is compassionate. Strength is necessary, but strength is not sufficient. Now, have you met someone who helped you, but he helped you with, uh, helped you with this, uh, this condescending attitude and frustration and arrogance, right? The weeping and grieving saints may appreciate the solution to their trials, but they absolutely need compassion, grace, and kindness. And you need not fear, God is omnipotent, and at the same time, God is tender-hearted. And my, my wife and I like this song, it's called Jesus, Strong and Kind. As a combination you don't see every, every single day. I, we listen to it sometimes in the car, and I'm often moved by this song. And it says this, <coughs> Jesus said that if I thirst, I should come to him. No one else can satisfy, I should come to him. Jesus said, I, Jesus said if I am weak, I should come to him. No one else can be my strength, I should come to him. Jesus said that if I fear, I should come to him. No one else can be my shield, I should come to him. Jesus said that if I am lost, he will come to me, and he showed me on that cross, he will come for me. For the Lord is good and faithful. He will keep us day and night. We can always run to Jesus, Jesus strong and kind. You have a very powerful Savior, and he is very kind. Number four, God is imminent. God is imminent. There is this ever-present temptation for saints in distress. You are apt to think, well, God is very far. God has distanced himself from me. God has left me in this mess. That's not true. Look at the verse right before our text. Look at verse 18. Verse 18. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Isaiah 43, verse 2. When you pass through the waters... I will be with you. Deuteronomy 31, 6. It is the Lord, your God, who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. God is not distant in suffering as some believe him to be. The Bible even goes so far as to say it is as if he himself suffers in their suffering. Isaiah 63, 9. In all their afflictions, he was afflicted. Maybe. Maybe there's a passing cloud, but the sun is so bright. The sun is so there. The sun has not gone anywhere just because there are some gloomy clouds, right? You, you all believe that. And so your God is also ever near you. And fifthly and finally, God is faithful. God is faithful. God said he would deliver you from all your afflictions. All your afflictions, how shall we know that this, this is true? We know because he has already given us a token of love, a testimony of salvation, and a proof of his comfort for us. He saved us. And if you are apart from, from Christ this morning, I speak to you now as well. Because this is the only way for you to be righteous. This is the only way for you to inherit this great promise of comfort and pain and sorrow. This is the only way for this verse to be completely and perfectly applicable to you. God has saved sinners like you and me. We were all born in sin and brought forth in iniquities. We were entangled in transgressions and by nature children of wrath. We neither love the Lord our God with all our hearts and souls and strength, uh, nor do we love our neighbors as ourselves. We worship ourselves. We're obsessed with ourselves. Uh, we, we, uh, we're consumed with our own selfish interests. We love ourselves above God 
and above everything else. The wages of sin, the wages of this sin is death. And the end of such a way of life is eternal destruction. But God, when we were afflicted with wrath and judgment in this life, God sent forth his son, Jesus Christ, in the person of Christ. Uh, Like us, Jesus was truly human, born of a virgin under God's law. But unlike us, the Son of God, Jesus, never sinned. He is righteous and he is perfect in and of himself. Not only is he righteous, he said that he came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. On the cross, he, he bore our iniquities, he owned up our sins, he stood in our place and he substituted for us. God's wrath was unleashed upon him on our behalf. Our sins and our death, they were given to him. His righteousness and his life were given to us. And on the third day after his death and burial, Jesus rose triumphantly from the grave because death cannot take hold of him, a righteous man and an innocent sufferer. And he proclaimed forgiveness of sin everywhere so that if anyone, young or old, male or female, Jews or Gentile, slave or free, great sinners or little sinners, if anyone should repent of their sins and trust in him, his finished work, he will be saved. This is his token of love for you. He who delivered you from sin and hell, he will still deliver you from all your troubles in life. He delivered you from the biggest, the grandest possible trouble, will he not also deliver you from the earthly sorrows and pain? And so consider then where your help must come from. It comes from the Lord, the sovereign, the omnipotent, the compassionate, the imminent, and the faithful God. He is a very sufficient savior for you. Number two, consider what it is that the Lord will do for you. Consider what it is that the Lord will do for you. That is, God will deliver you. Verse 19, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. You need to have the sure expectation that God will deliver you in the hardest of days and the darkest of nights. This is not wishful thinking or daydreaming at all. That is called faith in this promise. I didn't say these words. You didn't come up with these words. God said these words. That, if you trust in that, that is called faith. God is pledging here through his word that he absolutely will deliver you from whatever troubles and trials that seem just impossible for you right now. What is the gift of faith for if it is not for moments like this. You can and you must boldly take hold of this promise. And you must tell yourself, or really let the word of God tell you, God will deliver you from it all. Now, a few things to be mindful of. First of all, you need to be mindful of the possible forms of deliverance from God. There is no, not one way of deliverance. God does not deliver everyone from every trouble in the exact same manner. God could be bring a complete end to your affliction by giving you exactly what you want at his appointed time. For example, Hannah was barren. She was painfully mocked by her rivals. He was grieved for childlessness. How did God deliver her? Well, by giving her many children, right? Job was afflicted and troubled. He wanted relief. And what did God do? God did exactly what he was asking for. God relieved him from his pain, and God gave him many possessions. You may want to marry, find a job, or have children, and God can deliver you by giving you these things at his time. But that is not the only way of deliverance. I think at times we we think this is the only or the best way of deliverance or happiness uh, that we're reluctant to receive from God any other forms of deliverance. But God can also strengthen your faith and give you comfort 
uh, so sufficient that the affliction no longer triggers and brings much sorrow anymore. Where it is entirely possible that God could let you battle it out with the afflictions for the rest of your life on this side of eternity. While you battle, he always gives you grace and strength sufficient for the day to get through, and, and he brings the sweetest and ultimate deliverance on the last day of glory. Right, Revelation 21, verse 1. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. I would like to think or speculate some of these saints cried all the way to glory. And when the divine hand touched them, grief becomes foreign, sorrow becomes distant, pain is bygone, they weep no more. And that's how the Bible ends, and that's how eternal glory begins for you. So be mindful of the forms of God's deliverance. Be mindful of what God's deliverance may look like for you. And secondly, you should be mindful also, of the timing of God's deliverance. We have an instant gratification problem. Understandably, we want the time of deliverance to be as close to the time when afflictions began. Right? Of course, afflictions are painful. Pain. It's not wrong to hope for relief to come as soon as possible. It is not sinful. It is not evil. However, as all saints can possibly testify, God's agenda is often an entirely different one than ours. Right? Deliverance and comfort will come, but they're not Amazon packages, and they may not come today. Right? And, and so it requires our patient endurance, perseverance, and waiting. Waiting is the humble forsaking of our own need for instant gratification and our submission to God's timing of relief and fulfillment is the humble forsaking of our own need for instant gratification and our submission to God's time of relief and fulfillment. Waiting. Waiting is a great virtue in the Christian life. Waiting is often necessary. Uh, is a necessary pathway to comfort and joy. Waiting is the best lesson in the department of sanctification in the school of Christ. Isaiah 30, 18. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all those who wait for him. And finally, be mindful of our responses when God does deliver. Psalm 50, verse 15. Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you, and you shall glorify me. Job glorified God after he was restored. Hannah glorified God after she was given a son. Joseph glorified God after he was reunited with his family. Paul glorified God, being sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. Give glory to God when he delivers you. And our final consideration. Consider what it is said about God's deliverance. Consider what it is said about God's deliverance. That is, God delivers us from all our troubles. Verse 19. Look at verse 19. But the Lord delivers him out of them all. Here is the crescendo of this sweet melody of God's promise. Here is the pinnacle of this marvelous divine pledge. If you have been uplifted by this promise, God takes you even higher and even further. It is as if it did not just please him to just say, but the Lord delivers them. He must add, the Lord delivers him out of them all. God is saying to you, name a trouble in your life, nay, pile upon me all the troubles of your life, pile upon me all the troubles of all the saints everywhere at all ages, I will deliver them from it all, without exception, without fail. Now, some final note as I conclude, speaking to different groups of people in this sanctuary. First of all, if you are, a, you are suffering as a believer, and you are a member of this church, 
Find a fellow member in this church whom you love and trust, with whom you click well, as they say, and whom God has brought alongside with you. We are called to weep with those who weep. We are not designed to weep alone. If you are a member of this church and someone finds you and confides in you, you should be very thankful to God because he might have just made you his means and instrument through which God will minister his comfort to another. Be quick to listen, quick to pray, slow to speak. Listen, pray, hug, if that's your thing. I like a firm handshake more, unless you are my wife. Read God's word together and then repeat. Right? Consistency matters. Five minutes of contact every day is probably better than two hours of contact once a month. Now, if you are a suffering Christian and you are not a member of this church, I think that's a fair share of the people here today. I really strongly recommend you to become a member of a gospel preaching and loving local church. I'm not saying this because I am big on church membership, nor because I think it's a matter of obedience to God, even though both of these things are true. And it's definitely not because I think church membership can magically take away your suffering or grief where I'm just trying to expand this church to as many people as possible. I'm saying it because church membership forms or puts you in a position to form strong bond and connection with those whom God may use to minister comfort and joy to you. And thus, it puts you in a good position to receive the regular care uh, that you may need in the time of sorrow. You may think you are friends with, with people in this church just fine without being a member by coming here two or three times or every week for, uh, for the month. And that might be true for you subjectively, but the camaraderie and the fellowship and the friendship and the relationship you forge as a member of this church is going to be very different entirely. Maybe for some of you, church membership is the first step of comfort and deliverance. And finally, if you are suffering as an unbeliever, you may be seeking all kinds of remedies, self-help, positive thinking, therapy, exercise, new hobbies, entertainment, more friendship, or even alcohol, or drugs, or sexual pleasures. Maybe you have even heard the therapeutic gospel that Jesus came primarily to make you feel less depressed and anxious, and to make you feel better about everything in life. Friends, you know there's only one way. There's only one solution. Repent and believe in Jesus, his righteous life for sinners, his atoning death for sinners, and his triumphant resurrection for sinners. This is the only way for you to be put in a position where effective and enduring comfort for your soul may possibly come. The only way for you, for your suffering to truly end. In Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Jesus' words ring true still today. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So come to Jesus in repentance and faith. Afflicted saint to Christ draw near, your Savior's gracious promise here. His faithful word you can believe, that as your days your strength shall be. Your faith is weak, your foes are strong, and if the conflict should be long, the Lord will make the tempter flee, that as your days your strength shall be. When called to bear your weighty cross or sore affliction, pain, and loss, or deep distress or poverty, still as your days your strength shall be. So sing with joy, afflicted one. The battle is fierce, but the victory is won. God shall supply all that you need. Yes, as your days your strength shall be. So remember Psalm 34 verse 19, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, you have so graciously and lovingly provided this great comfort 
through your word, through your great promise to us this day. Lord, we love Christ, we trust in him, and he is the token of love and testimony of your kindness and deliverance to us. That he has delivered us from the greatest trouble of our life, even wrath, condemnation, and hell, so that we may be safe and secure in him. We thank you for your great love and kindness to us in promising to us that you would deliver us from all our troubles. I pray that the saints this morning has been helped, edified, and I pray that your spirit will now impress this, this truth, this promise upon their minds, that all their days, even as they carry the great burden of troubles and sorrows and afflictions in their heart, they will equally carry the weight of this great promise upon their souls. I pray for those who are apart from Christ this morning. They have heard the only way to righteousness, to enduring and lasting comfort. I pray that they will look to Christ and be saved, we pray. Amen. Amen. Great are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers us out of them all. Praise God. The Lord saves. The Lord truly saves. As we are about to partake in the Lord's Supper, I pray that we would see that this is a special time for God's special people. His people from every tongue, tribe, culture, nation, he calls them to sit down and, and share a meal together and to remember our common uniting benefit, his death. As the world continues to separate over individualistic pursuits, the church's sharing a meal together is meant to strengthen the bond between those who are of the redeemed. So at the Lord's table, what we do is we, we remember how Jesus, the good shepherd, showed his love for his sheep by giving his life, laying down uh, his life for the undeserving. He said, I came to give my life as a ransom for many, and that he did. In his last Passover meal uh, that he would share with his disciples, he initiated the Lord's Supper that we now partake in on a regular basis. And, and this meal far surpassed all of the Old Testament sacrificial meals that they previously partook in. Those meals continually pointed to the fact that sins were not yet paid for completely. But the Lord's Supper reminds us that Jesus' payment for our sins has already been accomplished. And as great as that is, that's not the end. The Lord's Supper also looks forward to an even greater fellowship meal in God's presence in the future when there will be even greater joy because we'll be eating in God's presence totally free from the power, the penalty, and the presence of sin. Praise God. But even now, we can still enjoy the Lord God as we eat and drink in the spiritual presence that he brings uh, as he walks through the midst of the churches, as you see that in Revelation, chap Revelation chapter 2 and in, in, in chapter 3. If you know the Lord as your Savior, and as Peter was stressing the importance of belonging to a local body of believers where we unite covenantally to care for one another, to love one another in this, in this more than a contract type relationship where it's out of love, that I am there for you, and I pray you're there for me as we go forward. Um, as, as, as we see over and over in Scripture, I pray that you would have that. And of course, most importantly, I pray that you know the Lord as your Savior. Um, if you don't know the Lord, your Savior, that means, as your Savior, that means your sins have not yet been paid for. And this meal provides no benefit to you as it does to those who trust that his blood has paid for our sins. So what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to have those who have been born again by the Spirit of God come forward and partake in this special time of communion 
uh, with our Lord. As I said, if you are not a believer and if you are concerned about uh, church membership anywhere, we are in good standing with a Bible-believing church. We can talk about those things afterwards, but now, for now, let us uh, pray. Lord, I thank you that you have made this time uh, special, special uh, by your plan of salvation from before the foundation of the world, Lord God, where you uh, uh, took the names of all of those who uh, you would save, you would elect, you would adopt, and you placed them in, in, in what's called the book of life, the Lamb's book of life, Lord God. And we come before you and we want to honor you at this time. Thank you, Jesus, for initiating this time of intimate uh, fellowship. And thank you, Holy Spirit, for keeping us faithful to participate in this ordinance. Lord, I pray for those who have not yet been born again, that you would grant them new life in Christ. I pray that one day they would not only be able to participate in this meal, but be able to participate in the great supper of the Lamb in the new heavens and the new earth at the uh, restoration of all things. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may come forth. Before Jesus would be crucified, when the hour came, he reclined that table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us eat. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Let us drink. Father, we thank you, Lord. We owe everything to you. Thank you for sending your son out of this great love that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. 
eternal life, life to the full. You are glorious and your son is glorious. And we praise you, Lord God. And I pray we would never forget the sacrifice that was made to secure our salvation. And I, I, I further pray that we would continue to live like it, Lord God, that we would continue remembering the sacrifice that was given ultimately for your glory and our restoration. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The ushers will now come forth as we will take up an offering, honoring God with the first fruits of our increase. And I'm going to ask um, Anthony to pray over the offering. Let's pray. Dear Holy Lord, Father God, you know that all good things come from you, Lord. Apply all of our needs. Provide for us, Lord. We pray that um, you know, please bless this offering as we can and joyfully. Um, and Lord, that you would uh, keep a joyful heart for us that evening. Amen. 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 While he does that, I'll make a couple of announcements. Uh, this afternoon at 1, we'll be having our afternoon uh, prayer. Uh, you can uh, stop by. You can let your request be made known, and we can pray for you if you don't have time to stay. Um, it would be great if you, you know, shared uh, that time that you may hear our prayers, and throughout the week, perhaps, when we're too crushed to pray, then we can know that our brothers and sisters in the Lord are praying for us. Um, also, this morning, we had our, our, our mixed Sunday school class. Uh, the ladies will be uh, picking it up next week upstairs. Uh, they're in Exodus. We're in uh, the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, Thursday night, 730, we have our uh, Bible study. And we're, we'll be in Deuteronomy chapter 18, a great chapter. Um, even read it on your own this week. I, I pray you'll be blessed by such a great chapter. Um, thank God for that. I'm going to ask the uh, worship team to sing, and I'm going to ask you guys to stand. Let's all rise as we sing our last song, Yet Not I, But Your Christ in Me.
us pray. Father, it is so comforting to know that whatever affliction may come upon us, you are able to deliver us out of them all. My prayer for your people is we will learn to wait. To wait on you, Lord God, to trust that our afflictions are not unknown to you, Lord God, to, to understand that it is you who are in control of all afflictions as you uh, are reigning, Lord God, and your son is at your right hand and nothing escapes, neither one of you, Lord. And we have been covered, we have been protected as uh, those who have been born again uh, from above, Lord. We look to you for our all. And I pray that would not only be when things are good, but when we're feeling miserable, when our hearts are aching, when this world continues to fight against us, and when the enemy of our soul just shoots those fiery darts one after another, Lord God. I pray that we would not look at the circumstances, but keep our eyes fixed on you. Lord God, I thank you. I thank you that as long as we are breathing, there's a purpose. There's a reason, which means there's a hope. Help us, Father, to wait patiently on you, to understand that this is just another season. And let us recall all of the times that you have delivered us, all of the times that when we did wait on you because there was nothing else that we could do, you brought us out. You gave us joy once more. You gave us hope, Lord God, that you have not abandoned us. And I, I pray that this would be another one of those times, Lord, as, as I don't know what everybody is going through, but you do. And Lord God, I pray that you would strengthen them, that you would uh, uh, give them a new understanding, Lord, um, if they didn't have it before, that the Lord is my rock, my shepherd, my king. He is the one who defends me, who keeps me. He is the good shepherd. Lord, I thank you for all that you have done. And I pray that the, the, these people here would look to you for uh, 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 their hope, their eternal life, Lord God, with you. That, that, that works even now. May our hope not be in this world. As this hope is burning. As this world is burning, I should say. Please help, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Have a blessed week.